On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini-series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we have been reading, watching, and or listening to during self-isolation. To begin our mini-series, I'm going to turn things over to our Readers Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. So the first thing I want to talk about is to thank everybody that came to our book buzz last week. Hopefully you had a really good time, as good of a time as we did, hearing about all the great books that are just came out and that are coming out. If you happen to miss the book buzz or you wanted to watch it again, <laughs> below in the show notes, we will put a link to the recording of the book buzz on our YouTube channel. So please look at it. We were really happy to talk books with you. Second, I just want to talk about a book I just finished. It is called How Long Till Black Future Month. It is by J.K. Jemison, and it's, she's a three-time Hugo Award winning author, and she challenges and delights readers with the thought-provoking narratives of destruction, rebirth, redemption, that sharply examines modern society in her first collection of short fiction, which includes never before seen stories. These 22 stories offer a broad spectrum of subgenres, including steampunk, climate fiction, time travel, post-apocalyptic, and cyberpunk. The name of the collection comes from an Afrofuturistic essay, unfortunately that's not included in this book, that she wrote in 2013. Four of the 22 stories included in the book have never been published before and others written between 2004 and 2017 have been published in speculative future magazines and other short story collections. The setting for three of these stories would later be developed into full length novels. So I wanted to share three of my favorite stories in here. The first one is called La Agumusta, and it's about a chef who is challenged by a stranger to prepare a recipe he provides. And the second one is the storyteller's replacement, which the narrative tells a story of a king who hunted dragons, believing that eating their heart would allow him to sire a son. And last but not least, a Cuisine des Memorines is about an unbelieving man who visits a restaurant that can recreate any meal from history. I really recommend this collection. It's fantastic. She's just a really great author who just adds a bunch of different perspectives of those that really haven't been represented in the sci-fi fantasy genre before. And that's all I have to talk about today. So I'm gonna pass it on to Stephanie. Thank you, Michelle. Well, I read the latest in the Lady Darby series, which is by Anna Lee Hubbard. The book is called A Stroke of Malice. And it's set in January of 1832. And all the stories take place in and around Scotland. And the main character is Lady Darby. Her name is Kira and her husband, Sebastian Gage. Anyway, they're invited to the Duchess of Bowman's home for the 12th night celebration. Everyone gets an assigned character and then they have to dress in that costume and then things start taking place. And the family acts like they're very happy, but they know that something is going on, which of course is murder. Um, anyway, the story, it goes where they go on like a tour of the dungeons and stuff and the brothers, the Duke and the Duchess have a very open marriage the first two children of the six that they have are with each other. And then the other children he acknowledges as his own children, but they are from different fathers. And I'll just say it's more than one. And anyway, um, the character, so there's a lot going on. The, the only daughter is in a very unhappy marriage and her husband disappears and they find this body down in the crypt. And everyone, it leads them to believe it's him. But there's a lot of twists and turns, and I'll just say it's not him. Not really in anything there. It, you kind of, it gives you the ins and outs of sort of like women, basically, if she chose, she wanted to divorce her husband, but if she did that, she would lose her children. She has no right to her children and things like that. So if he were dead, then she would be able to have her children and go on and 
maybe find somebody else that she might be in love with. But the case anyway takes, like I said, a lot of twists and turns and it's really, really good. And they kind of set you up. Lady Darby is pregnant in this one and they kind of set you up for the next story of what's going to happen. I highly recommend it. It's really, really good. And now this book that I did, um, I make cookies for my son who's a freshman in college and he's pretty picky. So I know he likes rap stars. So I found a cookbook by Snoop Dogg called From Crook to Cook, Platinum Recipes from the Boss Dog's Kitchen. And I made him the Rolls Royce PB chocolate chip cookies. And I think that he likes them. My husband had a few and he said they were pretty good. But I have to read you the little introduction of why you should bake these cookies. So it says, everybody knows my man Burner got the best cookies in the land. Thing is, the cookies he's slinging are for smoking, not for eating. If you're looking for more of a chocolate chip, peanut butter kind of thing, this recipe will leave you highly satisfied. And on that note, Gus, it did leave us satisfied. I gotta try those, Stephanie. Those sound really good. Uh, also, the, the romance one sounded good. I, I was just surprised it didn't have a cowboy or a millionaire in it. So look out for that next time. Maybe that's in, in the future uh, sequel to that book. But uh, on, that, on that note, I stumbled across this one and I uh, started it and it's really good. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. I had no idea about this story. It's called American Kingpin. Came out in 2017. It's by Nick Bilton. It's a nonfiction book and it is a true story. Like I said, it's nonfiction. It's about a 26 year old is by the name of Ross Albrecht and in 2011, he created something called the Silk Road, which is on the, the dark web. It's on the internet. And on this thing, you could trade anything. And we're talking about, when I mean anything, I mean anything. Drugs, you can have people killed, uh, forged passports, counterfeit cash, poison. I mean, literally anything. And it was, uh, it was the government couldn't catch this guy. They couldn't catch him at all. Had, after, after two years investigating it, they had no leads, no witnesses, nothing. All they knew was the, the site was ran by somebody named Dread Pirate Roberts. I don't know how they couldn't catch this guy, but eventually they caught him. I don't know how. And the Silk Road, I guess it, it turned into the, this $1.2 billion enterprise. But from what I hear, I don't think he did it for the money. I think he just did it because he wanted to be free. I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what, what it was, but it was a fascinating story that I, I heard about. I did not finish it. But I'm very excited to uh, get through it because it sounds like a pretty fascinating story. So American Kingpin, Nick Bilton, check that one out. And then I also wanted to continue my graphic novel reading. So I just grabbed this one. I'm a Superman fan. That's true. I like Superman. Superman Earth One by J. Michael Straczynski, who also has written a lot of sci-fi stuff. He also has written Star Trek stuff. I didn't finish this one, just started this one as well. But this is about, from what I read in the back here, it's about Superman, like a retelling, it sounds like, a new version of it. And it's when he was younger, when he was 20 years old. So I just wanted to see his take on it. And it looks pretty cool. Art's really good. And don't know too much about it, but uh, it did look interesting, and I definitely uh, am going to read this one. So that's all I've been doing. That's kind of what I've been reading lately. And with that, uh, I'll go ahead and give it to Nancy. Thank you, Gus. So what I was watching reading weekend on Labor Day, in honor of Labor Day, I watched a movie I hadn't seen before by the great Russian director, Sergei Eisenstein, his silent movie, Strike. Now, I've seen his historical films with scores by Prokofiev, um, but I'd not seen this film before. It was really very good. The copy is very well preserved. It's very intense. I actually had to turn it off a couple of times because it was very intense depiction of strikes in revolutionary Russia, but it's available on our Canopy service. And it, it's a beautiful piece of artwork. It's very intense, very critical. He got in actually a lot of trouble for the way he depicted the strikes from the Poldborough or the leaders. So, but if you like silent films and historical films, it's, it's well restored and very interesting. Now, as far as people using the archives, I'm in the archives, as you can see right now. We had some very interesting questions recently. 
In fact, someone, people ask about their homes, and so we answer their questions. Who lived there? Anything interesting? Architecture interesting? But I did get a recent request, and it turns out the woman that lived there was a musician. Her piano instruction books are still used now, and she was one of the founders of the Highland Park Music Club. So I was able to share with the owner this information about this club that was founded by women in Highland Park so they could express themselves musically because they were excluded from other cultural and music organizations because they were for men only. So this is one of the treasures of early women in Highland Park as they put together their club and they performed. And the club stayed in existence until just a couple years ago, the Highland Park Music Club. We have their records. Many of them are digitized and online on the Digital Library of America, thanks to the Secretary of State. But this was quite an interesting thing to put the pieces of the puzzle together for this woman in her home who were the piano teacher and used to live. And so that's kind of one of the real treasures we have here. This, this is their first minutes book. Another question I had was about cultural events in Highland Park. And what I shared with this person is that in 1978 to 79, the Highland Park Human Re Relations Commission and the Illinois Humanities Council had this program called Symphony of Many Cultures. And what they did is they tried to, to find out more about what people did and how they lived in Highland Park. And they had programs um, as a six-month project to try and understand cultural and ethnic organizations and how people could work together within the community. They had a seance on faith and fratricide, the excitement of Latino culture. And um, it was really an effort by Highland Park, Illinois, to bridge cultural gaps and understanding between different groups. So I was kind of heartened to see how much effort this was put into by these groups. And again, their records are part of our collections. And we can open it a little bit and you can see they had a workshop. And it's not dissimilar with what organizations are trying to do now to make society better and have different groups understand why and how things are evolving. You can see that closer, you can see that. And with that, I will hand it off to Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. It's great to see the archives. So this week, like Michelle, I was doing a lot of reading for the book buzz and won't go into those books because you can watch them in our archived recording, which we'll put in the link below. But one of the books I talked about was The Switch by Beth O'Leary. And before reading that, I read her other book, which came out last year, The Flat Share. Um, if you haven't read this and you like romantic comedies, it's great. The concept is that the main character is looking for a place to live. She doesn't have very much money. Her boyfriend has just dumped her, so she can't live with him anymore. And she finds an ad for this guy who wants to share his apartment when he's not in it because he works nights. And so the plan is that she will never ever meet him. He has a girlfriend, but they sleep in the same bed at different times. But they start communicating in post-it notes left all around the house and of course end up falling for each other. But it was a really cute story, great audiobook, and I highly recommend that and her new book, The Switch, that just came out last month. Also, the other thing I've been doing or watching, my new favorite show on Netflix, The Home Edit. If you haven't heard of this, they are two professional organizers. I've followed them on Instagram for years and this is their first book, but they have a new Netflix series that just came out last week where they organize people's pantries and closets and um, some, they do some celebrities and some regular people. So this is their older book, which I bought a couple years ago. Uh, I love their stuff. They like to put everything, they make pretty labels and put everything in rainbow order. And as you can see, I still need to do some more organization back here in my sewing room. And they have a new book out next week, I believe, called The Home Edit Life, which we have ordered and I have on hold and can't wait to get. So with that, I will pass it on to William. Thank you, Sarah. I was very happy to spend the Labor Day weekend in the past week playing Divinity Original Sin. 
as an avid tabletop RPG player and someone who came of age enjoying the isometric RPG experiences of Baldur's Gate and Planescape Torment, this was a nice callback to those games with the right updates for modern sensibilities. Even better, the console version of the game comes with a robust split screen support that allows, and with some puzzles requires, players to wander off from each other for extended distances, which has been a boon for me. The game itself plays a lot like a house-ruled version of Dungeons and Dragons, right down to the turn-based combat and dozens of fiddly rules for enemies and spell interactions. The spell interactions are especially in interesting. The other day, we experienced a total party wipe while trying to sneak up on a group of particularly tough orcs. The final solution? Set up both a poison cloud and a flame pit to force the leader of the orcs around a stalagmite and the others to keep their distance from our very, very squishy party of rogues and mages. The orc mage responded by stepping into a nearby puddle of water to put out the fire on himself and then summoning rain to put out the fire pit altogether. Now, we were fine with that, as that made him vulnerable to our mage's freezing spell, which was for the best, as had he used his lightning attacks, he could have potentially stunned our rogue that was sneaking up behind him and electrocuted both parties involved. Now, in addition to, like, really flashy stuff, there are also smaller yet equally satisfying interactions, like leveraging the ability to talk to animals to make a house cat the key witness in a murder investigation, blocking off poison vents by telekinetically moving bundles of hay on top of them, and taking part in a talent competition to distract a stage magician so we could pilfer the bodiless head he enslaved to be part of his act. Now, the company behind this game, Larian Studios, did so well with this game and the sequel, Divinity Original Sin 2, that they were tapped by the company behind Dungeons & Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, to make the next game in the Baldur's Gate series. So this is all the snake eating itself. This is quite the jump for a company that, for the original game, had to go to Kickstarter to get funding to make it happen. Now, you don't have to go to Kickstarter. You can, in fact, get it from, on the PS4 or the Xbox One from the, our friendly libraries in the consortia. So you should try it out. And with that, I will pass it off to Lori. Thanks, William. And um, well, if you're watching this on Friday, I hope you, you joined William and Gus on this past Wednesday where they were talking about the new video game platforms and video games that are coming out. And if you didn't, I'm sorry you missed it, but hopefully we'll do it again. Anyway, this past week I have been reading Flight Behavior by Barbara Kingsolver. It's an older book by her, and it's the story of a woman in, I think it's Tennessee. You should know I'm pretty much all the way through the book. A, a very impoverished family. I mean, they're basically really, really barely hanging on, and she is dissatisfied with her life and her marriage and she's on her way to have an illicit assignation and she stumbles across a bunch of monarch butterflies that have like veered off their path to Mexico and have come to roost in her in-laws family mountain forest that they have. Then it becomes a whole a whole big thing where she learns more about, it has to do with um, changing climate and academics start coming in and then people see it as like a gift from God. And it's very, very good. I think Barbara Kingsolver is really good at showing a lot of different types of people and how people view different natural phenomena in the world. I highly recommend it. It is going to be discussed by the Environmental Discussions book discussion group on October 21st. So if you remember, you can always join in for that. That is run by the Go Green Highland Park group. And the other book I've been listening to is The Dutch House by Ann Patchett, which is narrated by Tom Hanks. And I really do enjoy hearing him narrate it. Uh, it's the story of a, kind of like a growing up story of of two kids and their family in this gigantic house that was built by a cigarette baron at the turn of the century and then his father bought it in the 50s and then his family imploded. Anyway, it's quite good. I don't know how it ends. I hope it ends happily, but I'm guessing maybe not. 
But anyway, it ends. And I've been enjoying listening to that. So I, that is all for me, and I'm going to pass it back to Sarah. That's it for today, folks. As always, please remember that we are all here for you. We are available for comments, questions, or concerns that you may have, and you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email at hppla at hplibrary.org. We are also now here in person via reservation. You can learn more about this on our website, which is hplibrary.org. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned in our show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off. Until next time, stay safe. Bye.